phone, the thing that you talk to that's Amazon, something, something, Google, whatever. All this stuff is becoming better at what it does by you using it. And this is a new thing that uh, is slowly kind of permeating our popular culture and soon our medical culture. Um, I'm going to let him explain that at length. Um, but we're lucky to have him. <laughs> he's the, uh, so he's leading the deep learning team at Butterfly Network, uh, described as, in truth, truly, a medical device company dedicated to democratizing ultrasound. Um, their first product, the Butterfly IQ, which you've probably seen using, uh, is a handheld portable ultrasound that will use artificial intelligence to help you acquire and then subsequently interpret the images. Um, he's, he's gotten his PhD at NYU, where he studied computer vision algorithms. Then he worked at Google Research, uh, where he worked, at, worked on Google's machine learning TensorFlow framework, uh, where he conducted research on monocular depth estimation. And all of this has started to contribute to Google's medical machine learning efforts. He's going to talk to us about artificial intelligence in medicine, and then also specifically his work on the Fly Network. So thank you for coming. Thank oh, you. oh and one, one other thing. Uh, he's one of my climbing partners. And climbing is the new golf. Thank you so much. Is it too loud? How's it sound? Sounds good. Cool. Um, okay, thank you so much for that uh, great introduction, Matt. Um, so, Anita, I'm going to be talking about um, machine learning in medicine. Um, who here, just show of hands, has some familiarity with machine learning? Oh, so a decent number here. Um, has anyone done any machine learning? A little bit fewer. So um, what I'm going to talk about is um, I'm going to start off by giving um, kind of a high, very high level intro to machine learning. This is the world's fastest introduction. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about where we're seeing machine learning making inroads in medicine. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a particular application, uh, which is on the butterfly IQ. Um, so quick intro. There's various terms that people use uh, to describe various aspects of machine learning. Um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and then deep learning. So let me help disambiguate each one of these. Um, artificial intelligence is a term that you'll read about in the popular press. AI, the new AI, uh, X, Y, or Z. Um, this is a term that uh, most people who actually do machine learning don't typically use. Um, and when they do, what they're really referring to is a sort of obscure, long-term vision of the general level of intelligence we think of when we think of sci-fi movies and algorithms that are you know, just as capable as human beings um, on everything. Um, so typically, you won't hear people who do machine learning um, actually using that phrase artificial intelligence. So that's something that is coming a long way from now. Um, machine learning is actually a set, set of mathematical algorithms uh, that are very powerful, but still limited in certain ways, and we'll talk about those in, in a few minutes. Um, and deep learning is a particular subset of machine learning um, that uses something called neural networks. So uh, I'm going to describe uh, each of those in a little bit more detail. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that make up what machine learning is. I'm, I'm only going to talk about a particular uh, subset of machine learning. So what the world of machine learning looks like is grander than this, but uh, the vast majority of the big successes in machine learning are in a particular area called supervised machine learning. Um, and the whole idea of supervised machine learning is that you have a particular machine learning algorithm. It's a mathematical function that has a bunch of parameters in it, and I'll, I'll describe what that means. Um, you have some set of inputs, so those things could be images, those things could be text, um, and you have a set of outputs. Um, where do these, where are these uh, outputs come from? A human being has provided them. Uh, so you have a bunch of images, let's say, I'll give you a concrete example. You have a bunch of images of uh, dogs or cats. You've asked uh, human beings to go and manually label a bunch of images, and uh, what you want the machine to do is just replicate that process. So here in this case, you have an image of a dog. It gets fed to the model. And if we want the model to produce the word dog, uh, same thing maybe for a cat. Um, machine translation is another really nice example of the successes of machine learning. In this case, we have a sentence in English. How are you? It gets fed to the machine learning model. Um, this model has been trained on uh, millions or billions of pairs of uh, English, and in this case, Spanish translations. Um, and what the machine is doing, again, is taking the inputs and mapping them to the outputs that some human being has gone and specified as saying, okay, this is what this input should be mapping to this output. The computer is trying to replicate that process. Uh, same thing works for sound. 
so if, if, as uh, Matt uh, illustrated earlier, if you've used Siri or uh, Google Home, any of these products, how do they work? Uh, well, they have Google has trained a big machine learning algorithm, really a set of them uh, to take sound data, uh, which they have digitized and uh, mutated into a, a some mathematical form. That's a machine learning algorithm, and it has been trained to turn that sound uh, into text. Uh, same thing for some things like a part of speech tagging. So a sentence comes in, and you want the machine to produce a sort of part of speech tagging. Um, but so the thing I want you to walk away with here is supervised machine learning is uh, you have a data set uh, of inputs and outputs, and the machine is learning to map the inputs to the outputs. Um, so this very high level, what does what is the full development life cycle look like for a machine learning model? So uh, much of your life is actually spent in this phase, data set creation, right? Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but uh, everything machine learning is, is effectively garbage in, garbage out, right? So much of your life is really spent worrying about, like, is, is our data good enough? Um, so you have a data set that is inputs and outputs. You spend time training the model. I'll talk about what that uh, entails in one second. Um, you evaluate it, typically on some held out data set that the machine has never seen before. Um, and then finally, you're ready to deploy it. Um, and in each one of these phases, uh, commonly, you'll train a machine learning model and you'll realize, oh my god, our data set's no good, so we have to go back and uh, correct it. Um, and then you may actually think, oh, everything's great, you, you evaluate it on some held out gold standard, and it does terrible. And you have to go all the way back to the beginning. Um, so let me go talk a little bit about uh, what this looks like. So as I mentioned before, uh, how, and, and everything that I'm going to talk about is going to focus on images a little bit, uh, but the same thing applies to text and speech and uh, various other modalities. So uh, we have one of images. Maybe we've pulled these from the internet. Uh, we have a human being go and manually label them. Uh, certainly the most common way that these data sets uh, are acquired. Um, and there's various aspects of the, this process which make it uh, very, very difficult. Um, so one is size. Um, and actually, size is not really a problem when you talk about things that are at web scale. So you want to find images of dogs and cats, no problem. Right? You go onto Google, search for dog and cats, and there's a million images for you. Uh, what happens if you're, the data that you really care about is uh, medical data? And it's hidden behind a bunch of institutions which we don't necessarily want to share that data. Okay, so that, that makes getting any kind of data set of reasonable size uh, very difficult, and you have to uh, learn to work around that. Um, expert knowledge, right? So again, keep in mind, everything that we do in supervised machine learning requires we have a bunch of images, a human who then goes and says what the images are or where some particular thing you're trying to look for is. Um, it's really easy if you want to think about dogs or cats, right? You can go on to Amazon Mechanical Turk or some other website um, and just get a, a lot of images very, very quickly. But what happens if you're trying to train a model to do something very sophisticated? Maybe only a handful of people in the world know how to do. So you either get one of those people to do it or you don't. Um, so getting, uh, uh, having machines learn to do uh, very highly skilled or expert tasks um, can be largely limited by how difficult the task is. Um, of course, there's many uh, aspects of the labeling which uh, also complicate things. Um, sometimes it's not clear exactly how to phrase the problem formally or, or mathematically. Um, and then oftentimes there's a lot of ambiguity. Um, so uh, again, in medicine, this is also a big problem, which is to say that you could give a bunch of images to uh, certain people, and different people give you different answers. Uh, what do you actually do in that, uh, in that sort of tip? Um, and ease of data position I've already sort of covered. But the, the, the high level point that I want you to walk away with is uh, garbage in, garbage out, good data in, good data out. Um, so it's very common that people might uh, train a machine learning model in some regime, and uh, you test it on a similar regime, and you do very well, and think, yes, success, this, everything works. And then somebody points out very gently, like, yeah, this is great. So you train a machine learning model on a bunch of, let's say, the medical domain, a lot of healthy patients, and your data is beautiful and pristine, and like in real life, it doesn't work like that. Um, so it is imperative to really understand the regime that you, uh, you are collecting data, uh, and you need, to, you need to make sure that that matches the regime you're actually evaluating on. Um, okay, so I'm gonna um, now I'm gonna try to give you some very rough sense about what training it, it comprises. Of. What is when we talk about machine learning? Uh, what is the learning part? Um, so this is what 
enterprises learning is the subject of many PhD theses. Um, so I'm going to try to compress this into the simplest, quickest, uh, intuitive picture that I can. Um, so there's various aspects of what goes into training, and there's really uh, uh, five different points. Uh, the first is you need some set of inputs, and you need to map them into some mathematical space. Um, and that might not be very obvious. Okay, so if, you're, if your inputs are images, uh, that's not as difficult, right? So an image can be represented as a matrix, a 2D matrix, or a 3D tensor. Uh, that is certainly language that we can really able to understand. Uh, if you have things like sounds, words, the images, it becomes a little bit more tricky. Uh, but the high-level intuition that you show up with here is that uh, you need some way to represent your inputs uh, as a mathematical object, like a vector or a matrix. Uh, you need some set of outputs. Uh, so, you know, we give that example of dogs and cats earlier. Uh, in, in this case, when you're training a machine learning model, it's not spitting out a random word. You're, you're instead going to phrase the problem um, as one where the machine is producing some categorical output. So it's either a dog or a cat. It's easy if the patient either healthy or not healthy. It's a patient has sepsis or not. Um, Oftentimes those outputs are continuous, so uh, the best example of this is maybe you're trying to do, uh, predict where the stock market is going, and you have a model that has historical stock data, you want to be able to predict uh, what the price is going to be tomorrow. Uh, the model parameters, so I mentioned before uh, that uh, machine learning algorithms are effectively big mathematical functions, and the functions are parameterized by a set of weights. So when I say a function, what I mean is uh, there is a particular uh, mathematical family, like a linear model uh, or something more complicated, and the weights, uh, those don't change the family of mathematical functions, but they change how the function behaves. So what learning is, is really about taking the inputs and outputs that you've collected as part of your data set um, and finding the right parameters. Um, okay, finding the right parameters that do what? Uh, finding the right parameters that minimize the loss. So anytime you have, anytime you want to train a machine learning model, you're trying to optimize something. Okay, that something could be you want to minimize the number of mistakes I get. Uh, maybe you're trying to predict uh, stock market prices, and you say I want to minimize the distance between the model's prediction and the true stock price that I actually observe. Um, but there's, um, you're always doing something. Uh, you're always, uh, when it comes to learning, you're always optimizing a particular objective. Um, and one thing that I'm going to touch upon a little later is that it's really critical that you pick your loss function correctly. So uh, just to give you a, a little bit of a preview there, there have been a number of uh, papers published uh, within the medical space where people have declared victory on certain problems. And they, they say, oh, this is great. We've minimized this particular loss. We've minimized uh, you know, the congruence of a machine learning model at predicting a particular output given, let's say, a, uh, an x-ray. Well, of course, it's, you know, is that the right loss function? Well, it's not if that's actually not what a physician is actually doing. Right? So it's really critical that you pick the, the right objective. Uh, once we've done that, we have a bunch of inputs, uh, we have a bunch of outputs, we've managed to phrase our problem in this mathematical way. Um, we have, uh, we've picked a mathematical family that has a set that is parameterized, uh, and we know what we're, uh, we know what objective we are optimizing, um, now we actually need to find the weights. So I'm going to give you a super, super high level uh, idea about what this process looks like. So let's say we have a data set here in this case. Uh, this is a data set of housing prices. So we have a bunch of uh, features in this case, uh, age of the house, the number of bedrooms, and the size. Uh, and we also lose our inputs, and we also have a bunch of outputs. This is maybe uh, what our data set says uh, is the price for each one of these. Um, we picked a particular model family. In this case, it's a linear model. It's a linear model of three variables, alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, and the loss that we're trying to optimize, we're trying to optimize the difference between the model's predicted price, that is to say, a linear combination of alpha, beta, and gamma, and these variable values, um, and the true price. Does that make sense? Okay. So how do we find these? Uh, so I mentioned we have features, labels, here's the model. So uh, okay, this is what I'm going to show you is uh, an optimization algorithm I just made up called guess and check optimization. So how does this work? Okay, so let's start just by, let's guess. Okay, let's just guess. The best series of weight values for alpha, beta, and gamma are all zero. 
That's one, that's one solution to the problem. It's a particularly bad solution, um, so that the, uh, with these values, what the models are predict is zero across the board, and the total loss, the amount of wrongness that uh, we can calculate here is just the sum of the differences between the predictions and each of the uh, ground truth values, and then our total loss here is 69. So that's, that's a pretty bad guess. Um, so let's say I guess that I'll that gamma is 1. Okay, so we changed gamma to 1, um, and all that loss has gone down. So that was good. So I'm increasing gamma decreased the loss. We can decrease it further by changing gamma to 2. So far, so good. Let's keep it going. Um, push all the way to 3, and the loss has popped up to 57. So that was very bad. So we're going to go back one step. We're going to set it back to 2. And uh, instead of optimizing gamma further, now let's optimize alpha. So we just set alpha to minus 1. That was a good step. So that we, the loss has been optimized even further. It was 15. Now it's 6. And uh, I happen to know that we're at the right solution here. So I'm going to guess beta is 1.5. Um, and now we have perfectly uh, predicted the housing prices uh, from this data set. OK, so um, high level idea. What do we do here? We, again, we have a set of inputs. We have a set of outputs. We have this model uh, function. This is a, a mathematical function of a linear family. It has three weights, alpha, beta, and gamma. We uh, kind of picked and, and uh, we sort of guess and checked various values. Um, so that's pretty easy to do for three parameters. Of course, especially if you design the data set yourself and you know what the best ones are, that makes it really, really easy. Um, now, how do you do this for 10 million parameters? OK, so that is a lot harder. Um, and I'm not going to go into it, uh, because it's really what all of sort of mathematical optimization and machine learning is all about. But the, the high level intuition that I want you to walk away with is this. Um, what are all these machine learning algorithms doing? What does it mean to, to learn? Uh, what it means is exactly what we just saw, which is you have a set of inputs, you have a set of outputs, you have a loss function that you're optimizing, uh, like the number of incorrect examples, uh, or the difference between your model's predictions and some continuous value. And what your algorithm is doing is it's using some optimization algorithm, kind of like guessing check, but it's much, much smarter, um, to um, incrementally tweak its weights, to change the weights uh, slightly, but uh, gradually, to continuously <coughs> decrease how wrong it is when it compares itself to a human being's performance. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, so last two steps of the life cycle, uh, and then we're going to get into some examples here. Um, once we have done this training step, so we have a big model, maybe it has 10 million parameters in it, we use uh, one of many different optimization algorithms to actually find the right setting of those weights. Uh, we evaluate how we're doing on how the test set. Ideally, we do well, and then we can finally take this model and then deploy it in practice. Okay, so um, now I just want to get uh, back into some of these definitions. Um, you may have heard this term, deep learning. Um, so what is deep learning? Um, this is a fancy word for neural, neural networks. Um, of course, I answered one question and possibly another question, which is what is a neural network? Um, so I'm going to try to step through this real slowly. Okay, so what's a neural network? It's a sequence of nonlinear mathematical operations that changes the input representation to one which is more useful for performing a task. OK, that's a mouthful. Um, and before I try to digest this, um, I want to give you a very sort of high level example of where you probably already seen it before. Um, here's a little visual intro to uh, the visual cortex. Um, so if you remember a little bit of neuroanatomy, um, we high level and wavy uh, description of how what the visual cortex is doing. Uh, is really something quite similar. So the, there, there's a direct inspiration in what a neural network is and how the visual cortex work. And the high-level idea, uh, if you remember some of the, the pioneering work of uh, Hubel and Guzel, is that uh, you have, there's essentially multiple layers of representation of input, right? So light comes in, gets your retina, goes all the way back to the visual cortex. Um, and the first couple layers of the visual cortex, V0 and V1, are extracting some very low-level representation of the input. And those low-level are are things like uh, small edges, oriented gradients, that kind of thing. And as uh, information travels uh, further and further uh, into the various stages of the visual cortex, um, what your brain is doing is that the, the neurons are effectively mutating the representation um, from one stage to the next. So an image comes in, it's probably not quite organized like the way that an image is on your camera, but the same high level concept is that an image comes in, each one of these stages is performing some sort of processing 
um, and it's extracting different or different uh, representation for what that input image uh, looks like. So now we can go back to this definition. So what is a neural network? It's a sequence of mathematical operations. So we've already seen a couple of examples of that. Um, it's changing the input representation uh, in a gradual way. Um, and a neural network does this in a way that's useful for performing a task. What's that task? That's exactly what we've just talked about. So uh, a particular task is dictated purely by the loss function that you've chosen. Um, very, very high level picture of what a neural network is. So you have a particular input layer. Again, this is uh, examples of this are the sort that we've talked about before. Uh, an image, a uh, sound, uh, could be some discretized way to look at a page of text. Um, there is a mapping uh, from each of these inputs to one of these uh, hidden layers. You can think about these as neurons, uh, if you remember a little bit more from your uh, neuroanatomy. Um, and what this operation does, in this case, this is a, representing a mathematic a matrix multiply, it's changing the representation from this input layer to the second layer. And this second layer, uh, the second layer representation is effectively more useful than the first one at performing the task that we ultimately care about. Um, so don't worry about the details, um, but I do want you to walk away hopefully with a little bit of a picture of like, hey, what's a neural network? It's this thing that takes an input, uh, it changes representation over multiple stages, um, and makes it more amenable to the task that you actually care about. Um, and I'll give you a little bit more uh, intuition for what these things are actually doing. There's a lot of research that goes into really trying to understand how these big mathematical models work. Um, and a lot of what that research is illustrating is a concept similar to how the visual cortex works, which is um, each layer of a neural network is extracting features, extracting information, or is representing the inputs um, in ways that are more and more abstract. So in, in the first couple features are extracting very low level information like edges, textures, uh, lines, that kind of thing. Um, and as the processing gets uh, deeper into the model, uh, it's extracting much more higher level features. So the high level abstract concepts are effectively built out of primitives that are represented in the lower levels. Um, so uh, that's the end of our super fast machine learning overview. Um, but here's just the major takeaways. Um, what are these machine learning models? Well, they're big mathematical functions, and they are parameterized. So there's a set of weights that dictates how the model behaves. And learning is, is all about finding what the right set of parameters are. Um, most of these models, today, the successful ones anyway, uh, use neural networks. Um, these are hierarchical representations that map inputs to outputs. Um, and the right parameters are found uh, by minimizing some objective or loss function. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about um, when we shift gears and talk about how is this actually used uh, in medicine today. Um, so there's a number of tasks which are really commonly used, and I'm going to start with some of the tasks and some of the applications. Uh, the most basic one is classification. So you have some input, that input could be an image, it can be a, uh, some maybe notes taken down by uh, somebody at a nurse's station. Uh, it's passed to a model and out produces some category. So maybe this is a patient has sepsis or not, uh, is this patient uh, needs to be admitted or not. Um, so here's a very specific example from ultrasound. Uh, maybe you have an image and you want your model to be able to uh, know what part of the body that that image comes from. Right? So this is a very, very well-defined task. Uh, this is the kind of thing that if you want to get uh, labels for, it's very easy to do. Uh, we can find uh, one of the number of people who know how to do ultrasound, ask them to automatically label things, um, and then you have a great machine learning model. Um, that works fantastic if your images are what, what I'll be described as canonical, right? So this is this is a pretty canonical-looking cardiac image. Um, you know, I'm not sure quite what this is. It looks like a lung, uh, but uh, for, for these sort of canonical views, it's sort of easy to build these kind of data sets. Uh, less so for, for some of these non-canonical images. Uh, the key point estimation is a machine learning task where you have an image that comes in give it to your model, and the job of the machine is to produce uh, points, so the uh, coordinates, effectively, uh, for things that you're really interested in. So two examples of this practice, uh, maybe you want to do uh, fetal measurement. So there's various fetal measurements that are uh, very useful in uh, OB setting. And how do you get those measurements? Well, there's two particular anatomical locations that you're really looking for. Once those are both just coordinates. Uh, once you have found those coordinates, then it's simply a matter of knowing what the distance is between them. So these can be phrased as key point estimation problems. Uh, segmentation is a 
super popular area of machine learning. Uh, an, an image comes in, you give it to your machine learning model, and out pops uh, what's called a segmentation map. So this is a pixel-specific map uh, where every pixel can take on one of some number of classes. So in, in the two-class case, maybe this is like uh, a zero pixel means uh, there's a healthy cell, and a one pixel means unhealthy. Uh, it could be that you're looking to segment, uh, let's say, the boundaries of a kidney. So a zero pixel might be outside the kidney, uh, a one might be inside the kidney. Um, but a huge number of problems can be phrased as segmentation problems. Uh, oh, here we go. So this is a very direct example. Um, here's one from cardiac. We want to segment the left ventricle. <coughs> so zero is outside the left ventricle, one is inside. Uh, here for abdominal, I think in this case we're looking for uh, IVC versus aorta, and, and here's an example of segmenting the kidney region. Um, while we want to do these things, well, of course, maybe you want to uh, understand what the diameter is, maybe you want to uh, be able to classify that the health of the kidney where there's obstruction, um, things like that. Okay, so um, really the most natural inroad into the space thus far has really been in radiology and pathology. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about a couple of examples. Um, so, um, it's very easy to see how we use some of those tools um, in examples like radiology. So, uh, uh, sorry, in pathology rather. So, uh, obviously, in these cases, there's various areas of pathology where there is very low inter-observer variability. Um, why does this actually happen? Uh, well, it happens because the job is just insanely difficult. Um, in a certain uh, very extreme circumstances, the, the amount of inter-observer variability is very low. So, as you might imagine, the uh, inclination to try to use machines to do this uh, is obviously very high. Um, and the motivation behind this is really that this, is a, this potentially is a job that machines can do very well. Right? How, how is a pathologist actually doing their job? Well, they might get a pathology slide, they'll look at it from various, uh, from various locations, they're sort of zooming in and out of different resolutions. Um, as you might imagine, it's, it's, uh, it's, e it's an incredibly hard job. Um, it's easy to miss very, very many details. The number of information in these slides is absolutely enormous. Um, and uh, it, it's, just, it's an example of a problem where, uh, for humans, uh, this is extremely difficult for a machine. The machine's not bothered looking at uh, huge amounts of information uh, all day long. There's, there's going to be no fatigue towards the end of the day. It's gonna be, there's less likelihood that it's going to miss something because it's been looking at images for four hours. Um, so there's actually a number of companies that have jumped in the space. Have AI is probably the most advanced one. Um, but what they uh, essentially are working on is working with pathologists to train models to identify various pathologies uh, in slides. Um, so as I mentioned before, this is an example of a segmentation task. Right? So they have a pathologist go in and uh, actually draw uh, contours around some of these tumors or other pathologies, and then they train the machine learning model to take images in. Uh, and then segmentation at the top. Um, of course, going back to one second, going back to this question of data and data sets, uh, you know, if the pathologists already disagree uh, on what makes a tumor, what doesn't make a tumor, uh, this is going to make it very hard to have a model that is doing sort of the right thing. Yeah. I guess that was my question. How do you control for that when they have low interoperability? Super, super excellent question. Um, it's very hard. Um, this is, this is, I would say, the vein of the existence of uh, many folks who do machine learning in some of these spaces where it's actually really hard to know the truth. Um, and the short answer is there's various strategies. Um, one is consensus. Um, so you take advantage of sort of wisdom of crowds. You ask a lot of different people about the exact same uh, image. And uh, you hope that uh, there is a clear consensus, there's a clear winner. Um, now there, there's a uh, movement of crowds where you ask people independently, so no one can bias anyone's opinion. And then there is uh, consensus where you actually get a lot of people into the same room, and they all have a conversation together, and they don't leave until there's like a single answer. Um, there's pros and cons of each. Uh, I think the statistician in you, their alarm should go off when they hear like, wait, they convince each other that like, surely, surely everyone agreeing isn't the true uh, thing that you're looking for. Um, but there frankly are pros and cons of each. Uh, the other, by the way, the other is there's a whole suite of machine learning algorithms which are concerned with uh, given a data set of inputs and outputs where you're out, you have many outputs for the same uh, images. Um, how can you infer who the better and worse antidote are? 
Um, really no problem. Um, but again, it, it effectively plays everything that uh, really happens in the deployment space. Um, MRI and CT, so we're also seeing uh, similar types of approaches being taken. Um, uh, our RSS are two of these companies. Um, and the idea here is um, really just to, to step into the existing pathway. Right? So we're already capturing a bunch of MRI and CT images. Uh, and various companies are stepping in and saying, hey, we can provide some sort of assistive interpretation. Uh, so we can uh, possibly help uh, a radiologist uh, who's already doing uh, whatever analysis they're doing, and then we can point out certain areas that they did by um, So obviously some pros and cons here. Um, the, the, the pros here is that the accuracy on the number of these tests um, is very high. Um, so there have been a lot of uh, big wins in this space, um, although I would say still largely uh, academic. Um, so there, there is uh, more and more uh, evidence that some of these companies are producing products that are being used in the field. Um, and uh, while this is very exciting, and the, the results that we're seeing so far are very encouraging, I think there's still a long roadmap to the actually being deployed in practice. Um, but again, the, the uh, possible and potential benefits here are massive, uh, which is that uh, we would potentially lower this kind of intra-observed variability. Uh, there's no, there's no Possibility of there being fatigue, things that are missed, things like that. Um, a lot of these deployments are not replacing anyone. They're really assistive, right? The, the point of these things is really to come in and help uh, help clinicians uh, possibly avoid missing certain minor details. Uh, the difficulty still, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, is uh, while imaging has had a lot of really big successes. There have been fewer in the case of working with natural language processing, so interpreting uh, text to immediately get some sort of insight. Um, and the other one, and this is rather subtle, but I just can't emphasize this more. Um, a lot of the big successes in machine learning today come from the use of extremely large data sets. Okay, so where, uh, let's say 10, 15 years ago, people were using data sets with, let's say, hundreds of images, uh, labeled images in them. Um, today, uh, if you don't have a data set with you know, 100,000 images, so it, you know, people sort of will be funny. Um, now that's, that's fine. So it is actually totally possible in many of these cases to get many, many images. And what does that give you? It gives you a lot of diversity. It gets you like, a full range of uh, patient conditions. Um, but what you get is, is not a uniform distribution over conditions. There's still a really long, I don't have to tell you guys this, but there's a long tail for, for uh, rare conditions. Okay? And what machine learning still really struggles with today is dealing with this long tail. So if you want a machine learning algorithm to do something very well on a number of cases that are very common, that is totally possible. If in your data set you have some disease and there's two examples of this documented, uh, that, is, that is still an extremely hard problem with machine learning. Um, so some examples of point of care before I get into ultrasound. Um, here's a, here's a, a real big success. So Google has um, built this diabetic neuropathy screening project. It's actually one of the projects that are involved with running with Google. Um, it was trained on, as I mentioned, 130,000 images. Uh, 54 ophthalmologists uh, were part of the panel that was used. Um, in this case, con consensus was used. So um, in the cases where there was some disagreement, uh, a lot of people got together and tried to understand okay, what, what should the ground truth be in this case. Um, five classes of severity for retinopathy. Uh, and, and over 10,000 images were using the validation set. Um, and right now the model is extremely accurate and uh, barely uh, Google's sister company is actually trying to roll this out. Um, here's another example. So um, um, iNuc is, is a company that has built this algorithm that sits on an iPhone. Uh, Remedial has built this fundus image. Uh, the idea here is that they want to take a pair of both these together uh, and put it in the hands of uh, point of care folks. You could pull out an iPhone out of your pocket. Uh, you do need this additional piece of hardware. Uh, so you take something that routinely would belong only uh, to an ophthalmologist but, and potentially put it literally in one's hands. Um, here's an example from text. Um, so this is from uh, David Sontag's group at MIT. Um, the idea here is that uh, you want to be able to warn uh, folks about sepsis as early as possible. Somebody comes into the hospital, uh, a nurse is taking down uh, vitals and maybe some more descriptions of what they're doing. Uh, they want to be able to take uh, text information, feed it to a machine learning model, and predict exactly uh, how likely is it this person has or is it an assessment. 
Um, so some of these models um, are of increasing uh, accuracy. So uh, this group has actually boosted the accuracy uh, a lot more over just taking the vital sign. As you can see, there's still kind of a, a lot of a decent amount to go before this kind of thing can actually be rolled out. Um, okay, cool. So now I'm going to talk about um, point of care ultra in particular and some of the stuff that Butterfly is working on. Um, so um, this is coming at a really nice time for ultrasound, which is that there is greater and greater uh, understanding that ultrasound should really be a uh, deep point of care tool, uh, not just in emergency medicine, but across uh, other areas as well. Um, I don't have to tell you this necessarily, uh, but some of the reasons of ultrasound, ultrasound uh, is obviously very expensive. Uh, you have a very large heart that an ultrasound uh, is typically on. Uh, it's heart based, you need multiple probes for different parts of the body, um, and of course it's complicated, right? So it requires a lot of training, often years of training, to really be able to understand how to use, uh, not just uh, not just interpret the image, uh, but also sometimes to you know, use these ultrasound terminals. Just for reference, this is the Apollo 11 command module, and I, I see the same image whenever I see these. Um, so Butterfly has developed a handheld ultrasound device, um, which is the Butterfly XB. That's this device here. Um, this is a very different ultrasound than anything else that exists on the market. Um, this one probe can scan uh, any part of the body. Um, so rather than having multiple probes, uh, linear, probe linear, and so on and so forth, um, this one probe is able to image uh, all these different areas. Um, and it's a small handheld device, fits in your pocket, and connects uh, right to your iPhone. So it's a real game changer in terms of both modality and in terms of the flexibility of the probe itself. Um, as I mentioned before, um, so this is some example of what uh, the images look like as they're coming off the device. Um, so, but again, this one device uh, can really be used uh, across the body. So no more swapping in and out probes uh, or grabbing the big heart base system. This is the kind of thing that you can uh, just pull out a small butterfly from your pocket and write your phone and you can get immediate uh, imaging capabilities throughout the body. Um, one of the exciting things about, uh, actually one thing I did not mention is like how are we actually able to do this. Um, unlike other ultrasound devices that use piezoelectrics, uh, this is a chip-based system. So the whole innovation behind the hardware of Butterfly's device is that we've taken the idea behind ultrasound and put it onto a chip. Okay, so we can manufacture these chips at very, very low cost, um, but also iterate very quickly. Um, so we're able to, in a matter in Actually, this is actually an older image at this point. Uh, but in a very short period of time, we can make changes uh, to the chip technology itself uh, and get to much, much more refined images. Um, and I anticipate within a couple of years, uh, the next generation chip that we're working on is really going to surpass anything else that you see on the market in terms of image quality. Um, so now we talk about a couple of examples of how we're using uh, machine learning on the IQ itself. Um, and there's really three big areas. So automatic interpretation, these are similar to the kind of things that we've seen already. Um, we want to be able to put the ultrasound proof into the hands of a, a skilled clinician um, and essentially have it speed up their normal exam. Right? So, um, and I'm going to show you some examples of this in a second. Um, and it's going to speed up the exam and potentially make it uh, more accurate by automatically performing these sort of routine uh, measurements that we're you know, all already doing. Um, second is last mile guidance. So uh, both during ultrasound education uh, and then really all ultimately in practice, it is often nice to get a little bit of a helping hand to tell you that uh, you know, a particular view is, is the best possible view you can get of a particular patient. Um, and this is a mechanism that we want to have built um, to make it really easy to pull out the probe and get good assurance that this particular view is diagnostic. And our long-term goal, and I'll show you an example of this, is end-to-end -end guidance. So our vision is that we want to take an OSAP probe, put it in the hands of a random person, have the computer guide that person to capture a guidance of you. So the high level idea is Google Maps for your body. So you plop the probe on and the probe tells the scanner to move up, rotate right, and hold there. And I'm going to show you an example of this. So uh, this example, which I'm going to show you now, uh, is an example of our uh, interpretation. Actually, the first thing you're going to see is this last mile guidance. Um, so what, as you can see, what this person is capturing is the name of the four chamber view. Uh, here's a butterfly connected to their iPhone. And what you're seeing on the bottom uh, is what we call a quality indicator. So as the, as the person is scanning, what you're getting is a real-time indication of how canonical or how diagnostic the view is. 
Um, and how do we train this? Uh, well, the same as being trained, uh, the, the ground truth is coming from a panel of cardiologists uh, and echo techs uh, who have essentially rated the quality of each one of these views um, according to uh, AAC guidelines. So as you can see, what they're going to do, they're going to capture a short chain loop, uh, here at the four chamber view. Um, after a couple seconds, uh, what you're going to see is the uh, image is going to be interpreted uh, live in real time on this point care device. Um, and at the end, what you're going to see is an ejection fraction estimated. So here we're seeing the ejection fraction of 66. Um, and then the uh, quality score is 77. So that is roughly the confidence of the model. Um, for everything we do, and I would say this is generally true about anything in medicine, uh, especially, is that it's not just, it's critical for us not just to produce the answer, uh, in this case, the ejection fraction, but it's also important for us to show you what we call the provenance. How do we get to that answer, uh, right? So if, if uh, a machine makes a particular prediction and it's a total black box, uh, it's very hard to know, to be able to trust it. Um, here in this case, and I would say for many machine learning applications, we show you, uh, let's see if I can play this again, is not just the injection fraction itself, but also uh, how we got there. And this blue region is, uh, is our segmentation of the left ventricle band. So what we're doing is we're uh, finding the uh, ED frame, the ES frame, and then we are uh, computing the injection fraction using uh, sensitive biopsy. Um, so I mentioned um, Butterfly's longer term goal is uh, a tool called Lutrical Acquisition Systems. And, and as I mentioned, the idea behind this being um, how can we enable anyone to be able to capture an ultrasound image and potentially a life-saving insight. Um, and what we've done is built a tool, which you'll see in a second, uh, which as you're scanning um, is going to provide for you an augmented reality interface that illustrates to you exactly how to move and manipulate the probe. So what you can see here, um, as for scanning, this is just a mirror of what the uh, iPhone itself is saying. The bottom is the V-mode image of the ultrasound. On the top, as you can see, as the probe is moved, you'll see an instruction pop up that tells the user exactly how to move the probe to acquire a diagnostic image. So this is the kind of thing that we're really excited about when it comes to, uh, firstly, ultrasound education. Right? We have a uh, class of 400 people, uh, a handful of instructors, Right? We think this is going to be a really exciting tool uh, for instructing a lot of people how to acquire diagnostic images. Um, and then long term, we imagine this is the kind of thing that might help people who really don't have any ultrasound education. Um, short term, you can think of like EMTs, nurses, uh, and eventually possibly even consumers uh, to be able to pick up this device and their iPhone and acquire a life saving insight. Um, the same idea really applies in telemed, so we're also very excited about um, some of the opportunities afforded to us by uh, using uh, our telemedicine interface. Um, and this is the kind of thing that uh, you, know, you have somebody who's, who's teaching somebody else how to do ultrasound. Uh, maybe that person's already gone home for the night, but they want to see what uh, kind of exam data is coming in. So we have an interface where a remote user can actually control what is going on on the remote iPhone. Okay, so you're at home, somebody's in the hospital, uh, somebody performing a scan, and you at home can uh, you know, change the game, change the depth, um, do all sort of manipulation, as well as perform telesonography. Um, so you can direct the person in the hospital scanning. Uh, maybe that person is also in a very remote area of the world. Uh, this is something we see as being very important to think of wilderness medicine. Um, and uh, this is also a mechanism for applying some of the uh, interpretation tools that we have. Um, so here's the big takeaway. The biggest impact that we've seen in, in terms of machine learning, uh, or the biggest inroads, have really been in image analysis. So uh, typically, or traditionally, the domains of sort of radiology pathology, but as we've seen in the last couple of years, um, a lot of that is being shifted uh, into point of care. Um, there's some progress in text-based interpretation, but I think that's still a little far away. Um, to, to me, the most exciting thing is really in, in point of care impact. Um, and that's also where the Butterfly Q, I think, is poised to make, to take this, this kind of impact. Um, and the addition of machine learning is one which I hope will make uh, a much bigger change to actually how medicine is actually applied. Um, and with that, I'll take questions.
extremely difficult topic, and you made it very understandable. You're an excellent teacher. Thank you so much. Um, in, the, in the area where machine learning, um, um, <coughs> where there's rare diseases, is that something where like blockchain technology might become beneficial, where you can just get those kinds of field chromocytoma, something that, you know, actually for 30 years I've seen one. Mm -hmm. So is that something like blockchain? Is, is, is blockchain a long, further along enough so that you could use that? Um, I don't think so, uh, or I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm not sure how you use technologies like blockchain to be able to identify those. There's actually a whole subset of algorithms in machine learning called one-shot learning algorithms, right? Show a computer a uh, single instance of something and have it learn. Some things are amazing for this. I mean, more incredible. Uh, you show someone, uh, I don't know, a, a new creature or something they've never seen before, you show them one example, and they can identify it again. Um, we don't know how to do this yet at the level that humans can, can absolutely do it, um, but I think some of the algorithms there are ones that are considered to be able to these kind of cases. What was the time period from like, the inception of this idea to The yeah. um, it's a great question. So, the, so Butterfly was founded six years ago. Um, most of that time has been getting the hardware ready. So this idea of taking uh, a piezoelectric device and putting it onto a chip is uh, extremely difficult. Um, the science behind it is somewhat well understood. The engineering is uh, very, very, very difficult. So it took the company a lot of years to actually make this a reality. There was definitely insurance times during that journey where it was like unclear, like, is this actually going to be possible? Are we really going to be able to make something that's diagnostic? Are the images going to be good enough? Um, and really in the last couple of years is where things have really taken off. So the company has uh, managed to solve some absolutely monumental engineering challenges um, and in the last couple of years, especially once the imaging is uh, as good as it is, and it's really only going to get better, um, that's when the machine learning is really started taking off. Um, and may maybe you haven't worked on this, but you know any projects or how to like they've been trying to work on how to implement machine learning to EMRs to kind of help doctors out, maybe like you mentioned sepsis or whether this patient needs admission. And how much input do the MDs have in it to make sure it's actually minimizing the work? Because the danger I see in this is that we're the manual inputters of like click, 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 input, input, and all we're doing is more clerical work instead of actually making things easier on us. Um, I don't know if you have anything to say about that. Do, do you mean like, um, I'm not sure if I understand, are, are you asking like what is the state of the art or what is well, the... Well, I think the danger I see in machine learning is we do more clerical work than clinical work. So we're manually putting the inputs, like this patient is 60, this patient based on like has heart failure, this patient has a murder. So all we're doing is click, 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 click. And you know, one of the things that's leading to burnout in doctors is that we essentially feel like clerks and not clinicians. Yeah, um, definitely. And I could see machine learning going either way. It minimizes the amount of clerical work we're doing, or it might potentially make things worse. 100%. So um, I would say in the, in, in, it certainly has the potential to make things worse if you're starting from scratch and you're like, well, I have a bunch of uh, data and now we need to go annotate it. Um, that's obviously going from zero to 60 is a lot of work. Um, the ideal picture is one in which uh, a lot of a lot of that has already been done, and where the machine learning takes over is uh, in determining clever ways to take uh, health record data that already exists and uh, figuring out exactly what records line up with other records. Like as you no doubt know, there's a, a million and one ways to convey really the same amount of information uh, when it comes to like. How, how a patient is doing, how a patient's feeling, like as far as a machine's concerned, right, any individual word, like words are either the same or not, even though like for us it's obvious that two words mean really the same thing, right? So only is, is uh, I don't know, uh, feeling, not, not feeling well, feeling terrible, like all these words are obviously mean roughly the same thing. But, um, I, so I think, I think where um, machine learning is gonna help potentially in, some of this health data um, is in A, helping <coughs> cut down the amount of uh, manual input that's done. Um, so either combined with uh, some of the imaging-based information, 
uh, right? So if a patient comes in, maybe uh, you're able to take a photo of them. You can automatically identify roughly what age range they are, uh, sex, that sort of thing, um, which is not necessarily going to be the final result. The final arbiter is still going to be the clinician, but uh, it's likely that there will be various things that will be proposed where the clinician can effectively pull down uh, proposals rather than putting it in Great, great, great question. Uh, so yeah, there is, uh, we have an extensive uh, IP portfolio, like a, a lot of the chip technology is uh, very, very well protected. Uh, as you might imagine, like, yeah, this, this is our, our sort of bread and butter. Um, in terms of price, so that the product right now is gonna sell for 2K uh, each probe. Um, and that comes with obviously uh, the app, which you just download from the, from the app store, and things like that. Our long-term vision is this could be like a sub thousand dollar product and potentially even cheaper. That's the long-term vision. If we really want to drive the cost so. I have a few questions I wanted to ask that kind of prepared. Um, but uh, do you see this as a consumer product? Yes, long-term. What do you um, mean by a consumer product? Yeah, great question. <laughs> um, so uh, there's various, um, there are various, uh, Sub products of like the full uh, device that we can imagine, say, in the of our tools. So, for example, um, you know, I can imagine uh, there are various programs where um, a person is asked to capture some information about them. So, it could be uh, like checking some of the bladder volume status, uh, it could be uh, capturing some objective tracking information um, that currently is uh, could otherwise be done at home. So, I can imagine this being the sort of thing where you get. Uh, a doctor to uh, send you an ultrasound probe uh, to your house, you're, you're doing some sort of like at home care. The machine learning is essentially just instructing you exactly how to hold the probe, um, and the data is just uploaded to the cloud for a clinician to observe uh, at a later date. Um, what, so the, the, the consumer products that I think we'll see are ones that have, that do utilize the hardware, um, but use, let's say, a trimmed down version of the application. So, um, you know, the, even this product, as simple as it is, uh, is still, uh, you know, has a huge range of functions, things like that. Um, and when it comes to consumer devices, we obviously need to be careful about how things are communicated, what people are interpreting, uh, that sort of thing. Um, one thing I did mention, uh, and I anticipate seeing uh, some inroads in terms of consumer products and some of these other spaces are um, some of the things that we're working on now. Um, so we're, we're also working on a wearable. So, uh, so this is like a patch. Uh, with a band that you wear over long periods of time. Um, so and the idea here is you'd be able to collect, uh, let's say, ultrasound information that comes off uh, an ultrasound device um, over long periods of time um, and sort of constantly provide information. Um, and the second is ultrasound uh, in a pill. Um, so both of these are much closer to the uh, what, What's stopping mothers from buying this? And yeah, great question. Um, uh, right now, we're only selling to uh, hospitals and clinicians. Um, I, I'm not sure what our rollout is going to be in terms of relaxing that, but for now, uh, it's really only going to uh, clinicians. Um, does anyone especially get, or do you have a question? How is, how is, it, is it based on an API, based on a license? How, how, if I were to go on the website, um, fantastic question uh, for our commercial team. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I actually don't know exactly how to do this. Um, I, I know we have had uh, a number of instances where people who uh, aren't MDs have come to us and said, you know, we desperately want one. And unfortunately, like we, we are trying to be a little bit restrictive in this sense. Um, uh, you know, to, to Matt's question, you know, the, the thing we don't want to happen is somebody getting uh, a device like this and over interpreting. Uh, what it's producing. Like, that's the last thing that any, anyone else brings. Um, so we just need to be very, very careful about how this is sort of uh, that. Uh, but for, again, right now, it's, it's really all going to help. Does anyone have uh, like visceral reactions towards this? Like maybe, do you want to share that? 